Disclaimer, this video exists for the purposes of entertainment, education, and theory rebuttal. This video is not an attack on the creator of the theory, nor will it, unless otherwise stated, address the theory creator personally. Instead, the creator's name in this video will be used as either a name to address the theory by or to address the assumed mindset of the creator at the time of this video's creation. Unless there is substantial evidence, it is not assumed the creator still stands behind the video in question. If you harass or witch hunt anyone involved with this video, I will personally disown you. Thank you. The Avatar machine is screwed up. I'm currently stuck as Silver the Hedgehog, and the machine won't stop searching Sonic theories. It's absolutely wonderful. Ugh, there's gotta be a reason this is happening. Do I have to cover the Babon theory that exploded me into the Undertale theory to get things back to normal? Because I'll cover the Babon theory, gosh dang it. Wait, the machine stopped. Oh, hey, it's a theory about Silver the Hedgehog. Great. I guess welcome back to Sonic Hack, ruled by our good friend Gamer Guide. This time we're moving from Amy to Silver with a theory on who Silver's parents might be. Oh, but this theory is special. This theory video is actually <gasps> two theory videos? That's right, today's stage is shared by Gamer Guide and another Sonic theorist, Sega Scourge. This video is the biggest non collaborative collaboration video I've ever seen. Essentially, Guy and Scourge are going to present two separate theories on the same topic and call it a collab. Or I guess a debate, though they don't really do much of that. At least Husky isn't here, thank goodness. Gather round, folks, because we've got a two-for-one special today. We start with Guy's Grand Magic Show, then follow it up with Scourge's Science Spectacular. Ready? The Avatar Machine might be screwed, but the show must go on! Welcome back, everyone. Now, we all know that Silver is from the future, and his backstory is a sad one at that. His future home consists of a world destroyed, being ruled by Iblis. Not too many people are alive in the future that we know of, and Silver was pretty much raised as an orphan, growing up and being trained to be able to control his telekinetic powers in order to one day stop Iblis. So, hold up. This isn't Silver. The Avatar Machine will never let me be topical, will it? Anyway, we're only 15 seconds into the theory, but I want you to keep this statement about Silver being raised as an orphan in mind. It'll come back up again later. Bumba! So, people have come up with ideas on who might be Silver's real parents. People say it's Shadow and Amy, some say Shadow and Rouge, and a bunch of others, but these are the most popular ones. <laughs> Foreshadowing is fun, isn't it? <laughs> Now, Sega themselves may have hinted at Shadow possibly being the father of Silver in their games. <laughs> Setting up those dominoes to watch him fall, huh, guy? Sure, let's pretend this is true for a while, huh? Notice in Sonic and the Black Knight, the roles that they have are very controversial. Silver played the part of Sir Galahad, Sir Lancelot's son, who was played by Shadow the Hedgehog himself. Sonic and the Black Knight is not at all an accurate depiction of Arthurian legend. For one, Arthur was never the Black Knight in the actual legends. For two, Lancelot and Galahad aren't the only blood relatives in Arthurian legend. Percival and Lamorak were siblings, which is absolutely ridiculous when trying to apply it to Blaze and freaking Jet the Hawk. And the bigger point, Gawain was the nephew of King Arthur himself. I don't know about you, but I just cannot see Knuckles the Echidna being the nephew of a straight up demon created by Merlin. Point is, you can't take the finer details of Arthurian legend and apply them to this game. Don't do it. Also, I'd like to posit that in one particular story, Lancelot marries a fairy named Iblis. Not a point, but it's absolutely hilarious. Certain similarities in appearance, abilities, and personality, combined with Shadow's immortality, suggest that Shadow may be who Sonic Team had in mind, the Silver's father. Yeah, I keep saying that. Maybe someday it'll be true. Also in addition, remember that the Sonic game universe is a parallel to Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> Sega themselves have admitted to this claim with Shadow being very similar to Vegeta of Dragon Ball Z and Silver being similar to Trunks. Vegeta is Trunks' father, further hinting that Shadow might be Silver's father. And if that's not enough of a hint, try switching Sonic characters into the Dragon Ball Z world and the Dragon Ball Z characters into Sonic's world. It is pretty much the same gimmicks and storyline. And let's not forget, Seven Chaos Emeralds, Seven Dragon Balls, the ability to turn super, you all get the point. Can you cut that out? There might be parallels, but there are very clear differences as well. The entire Sonic franchise doesn't parallel Dragon Ball. Only the super forms and silver similarity to Trunks were stated by Sega to be inspired by Dragon Ball. Nothing else. Sit down with your confirmation bias. 
So with that being said, judging by the facts that we have, it's safe to assume Shadow is Silver's father. Based on mostly coincidences! Yippee! Now here's the tricky part. Who is Silver's mother? While this one might seem more tricky, I also tried to put in facts and logic on what we have from Sega so far. I tried Amy, but that doesn't go so far. Plus, she's an erotomaniac who's obsessed with Sonic, right? I'm going to punt you out a window. I tried Rouge, but that doesn't go far either. She's shown more respect and friendship towards Shadow than her flirtatious behavior that she displays towards Knuckles. Really? That's the only reason you have? Not that I am one, but I think I speak for every Shadow shipper out there when I say screw off, good sir. So I kept narrowing it down. One reason I narrowed it down was that again, Silver is from 200 years in the future. So with that in mind, unless Amy and Rouge are immortal like Shadow is, this can't really happen. They'll both age and will eventually die within 100 years or so. So it can't be someone from Sonic's current world because of the 200 year factor. Yeah, guys taking this angle. We'll see why this is a problem later. But which female Sonic character is left? Well, which female character isn't from Sonic's world? Which female character has kinetic powers that could be inherited by offspring? The closest one to that answer is none other than Blaze the Cat. Ouch! Now I know most people won't like the idea and will think it's impossible. And I know one of the biggest rebuttals people will try to say is, Well, Shadow and Blaze have not had any interaction in the game, therefore your theory is wrong. Well, yes and no. Yes, Shadow and Blaze have not had a clear scene where they talk to each other. However, they have interacted. If you pay close attention to Sonic Generation's ending scene where everyone returns back to the party, you know that Shadow appeared at the party as well. And as the cutscene keeps going, it shows the characters interacting with each other. In the cutscene, you can clearly see Shadow standing next to Blaze, talking to someone, whom I believe is Silver because as the cutscene keeps going, it will eventually show Shadow and Blaze and Silver standing by each other when Classic Sonic jumps in the portal to return back to his time. Coincidence? I think not. But yeah, it is kind of funny that these three are talking when at this point, Shadow doesn't really know Blaze too well. Blaze and Silver don't really know each other either. Silver and Blaze actually interacted in Sonic Colors where they visited Eggman's incredible interstellar amusement park together and in Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games where they teamed up for ice hockey during the DS game's story mode. They also have a special victory pose together in both the Sochi and Rio Olympic Games games. Obviously, Sega wants us to know that Silver and Blaze are still very much friends, further supported by the future evidence of Team Sonic Racing. And it has been said by Sega that Shadow is one of the few that didn't forget the 06 event. Same thing as Sonic, even though that timeline was erased. So he might remember Silver. As for why Shadow is here, if he really does remember the events of Sonic 06, he definitely still remembers Silver, giving a reason for why he would talk to him. Shadow isn't there to talk to Blaze. Both Shadow and Blaze are there to talk to Silver. So, if Shadow and Blaze interacted in this game, who's to say in some future game they won't get to know each other more or maybe even become friends? And also, I wanted to add that Shadow was only really close to Rouge at this point, and she was at the party in the cutscene, yet Sega had her only talking to Knuckles. So why in the world would there be a reason to have Shadow and Blaze and Silver interacting? Shadow to Silver, Blaze to Silver, both of them know Silver. Please stop this. Okay, well let's look at this in a logical way, with the facts that we have at hand. If Blaze was to be the mother and Shadow the father, what other reasons can I give to support this theory? First off, let's start with chemistry. If you haven't noticed, both Shadow and Blaze have the same personality. Both love to be independent. Both have a duty of some sort to protect their world. They both like to be distant from everyone else. They both have actual powers. Shadow can teleport, warp, and Blaze has pyrokinesis. Yeah, sure. Exactly the same. Shadow is vindictive, aggressive, and rude. Blaze, on the other hand, is proper, self-conscious, and shy. Not all loner types are created equal, and these two characters are two completely different kinds of people. As for their duties, Blaze's duty is clear-cut as the Guardian of the Soul Emeralds. Shadow's duty of protecting humanity, meanwhile, is only a duty of his sometimes, as he can sometimes stray from this goal for his own ends. He's not rigidly bound to his duty like Blaze is. Finally, I shouldn't have to explain why the powers point means nothing. Also, in that scene in Sonic 06 when Shadow and Silver were fighting, Silver was able to induce a chaos control just like Shadow, even though he's never had any experience or knowledge about it before, which surprised Shadow. So they both have similar hidden talents. As the saying goes, like father, like son. And they both will do anything to get what they want. This does nothing on the Blaze end of things though. Can we please focus? But now on to the logic. I'm well aware that Shadow and Blaze are different species. 
However, this is a gang with anthropomorphic creatures that talk, have powers, and they have a human for a villain? Not to mention aliens attack their planet and they have been in outer space plus time travel. So the possibility of crossbreeding between a hedgehog and a cat in this universe is more than possible, thus making this theory open and valid. That's a logical fallacy, a complete nothing point. Stating all this proves absolutely zip zero nada. Anthropomorphic animals and human villains and aliens have absolutely nothing to do with whether or not the anthropomorphic animals can crossbreed or what the effects of that would even be. Bring up an actual point or sit down and shut up. Now think of it like this. If they were to have a child, it is more than likely and possible to pass down their powers to an offspring. So let's say Shadow and Blaze's powers were to mix. Shadow's strong points is that he can teleport and warp. Teleporting and warping meaning moving from point A to point B via telekinesis. Eh, wrong! Shadow doesn't employ any form of telekinesis. Shadow's powers come from chaos energy, which is the inherent energy within the chaos emeralds. His teleportation is chaos control, which is one of the powers chaos energy grants. Sonic can use it too, after all. Blaze's strong point is power kinesis. Kinesis meaning the non-directional movement of an organism or cell in response to a stimulus, and the rate of movement being dependent on the strength of the stimulus. In short, you can have the ability to move something or control something. Now with that said, obviously Shadow's teleportation skills must have telekinetic ability and Blaze's pyrokinetic skills have the ability to control her fire power. So if we put two and two together, if you were to mix Shadow's ability to teleport and Blaze's kinetic ability to control something, that would mix and basically give us telekinesis, which Silver the Hedgehog clearly has. Y you didn't just do that, did you? You didn't really just take the tele from teleport and the kinesis from pyrokinesis and mush them together to make a point about where Silver's telekinesis came from, did you? Oh my good gosh! No! Mashing up fire powers and chaos control does not automatically equal Silver's psychokinesis. Yes, I said psychokinesis because this is what Sega calls Silver's powers. It's not just telekinesis, it's so much more than that. He can shoot psychic waves, create psychic shields and psychic blades, use a small level of mind control, and can even teleport short distances, all without a single iota of chaos energy. Explain that to me, guy. Now, I think it's a lot to think about, but bear with me here. Remember, I said that the Sonic females couldn't give birth due to the fact that Silver lives 200 years in the future, and that it couldn't be possible that anyone in Sonic's timeline could exist for at least another 100 years, therefore destroying the fact that any of these female characters can give birth to Silver. Some of you might be wondering, well, why is Blaze any different? She exists in Sonic's timeline too. What makes her so special that she can live longer than the others? She is not even immortal. And that is true. She is not immortal, and she's only 14 years old. So how can she be the mother? Alright, I am now going to explain why all this is a great big problem. Spoilers for later, Scourge does not use this approach. He was smart enough to realize that this approach is the dumbest way you could possibly go about this theory. By using this approach, you are not only limiting your options to a ridiculous degree, but you are also having to contort absolutely everything to ridiculous lengths to accommodate your unnecessary demands. What do I mean by that? Well, Blaze is from another dimension, not Sonic's, and not from the future. Yeah, stupid Sega messing up their own games and character backstories. That is not true. Frick off. So with that said, Blaze's dimension and timeline could be very different than Sonic's. It is a possibility that in Blaze's dimension, one year in her world could be 30 years in Sonic's world for an example. This is what I mean by that. There are so many problems with this that I can't even begin to explain, but let's start with this wonky time dilation. Gosh, making me do math. What is this, high school? So if one year in Blaze's world equals 30 years in Sonic's world, that would mean one day would be equal to 30 days, one minute would be equal to 30 minutes, etc. One year in Sonic's world would be about 12 days in Blaze's world, and one week in Blaze's world would be a solid 210 days in Sonic's world. Keep all that in mind, I'm coming back to it in a bit. Now there are a hundred other possibilities as well, but we will go along with the theory of Blaze's time being slower than Sonic's. Why you may ask? Because it isn't the first time Sonic goes into another dimension and when he comes back, it turns out he was gone for a long time. Sonic Chronicles comes to mind. And since no other game features a different theory, it's safe to assume this theory is perfect. Oh, so now you're going to mention the validity of Sonic Chronicles. Sonic does visit another dimension in Sonic Rush Adventure, Blaze's dimension to be exact. 
However, because we are going with the theory that Blaze's time is slower than Sonic's, maybe one minute in Blaze's dimension is 25 minutes on his, for example. That's much different than the 30 years from before, but okay. One minute is 25 minutes, one day is 25 days, one year is 25 years. One week in Blaze's world is 175 days in Sonic's world. This is still important. This theory still works perfectly. Plus, let us not forget that Sonic doesn't really spend too much time in her dimension anyway. There it is. There's the big boy point. Didn't spend that long in Blaze's world, huh? They sure spent long enough to have an entire adventure with a crud ton of lengthy plot points, fight nine bosses, find all seven Chaos Emeralds, build five high-tech seaworthy vessels, visit an entire buttload of islands across the ocean blue, and learn the meaning of friendship along the way. I'd be generous to your theory and give it two weeks at minimum. Depending on which of your time dilation interpretations we're going with, they were there anywhere between 350 and 420 days, which is right near or well over a year. You say I'm stretching for a point? Well, we're still not done with this time dilation business. It just keeps on going. So let's use the information we have gathered and acquired so far, and once again, use basic logic and knowledge to see if this theory can be true. I'm sorry, but can I just mention that every time you say let's use logic or whatever, especially this particular time, all it serves to do is make you look like a condescending prick. Alright now, let's use a hypothetical theory to see if this possibility is true. If in some future game, Shadow and Blaze do end up getting to know each other more and become good friends, this would leave the theory that they would eventually fall in love because they are both similar in personalities and we all know that deep inside both Shadow and Blaze have a heart. <laughs> Sorry, don't mind me. Go on. If they were to fall in love, Blaze would be able to visit Sonic's world to see Shadow due to her being able to transport there via Soul Emeralds, and Shadow would be able to visit Blaze's world without it affecting him or his dimension. Now the reason Blaze can't stay in Sonic's world is because she is a princess in hers, not to mention she is the guardian of the Soul Emeralds, thus leaving her with the duty and responsibility to stay in her world. However, Shadow can stay in her world because Sonic and the rest of the gang don't really need him to protect the world. There goes that duty point from before, right out the window of logic and knowledge. So Shadow and Blaze eventually get together and Blaze gets pregnant. Now that is just one theory. The story could change drastically. Maybe Sonic's world is threatened and both Shadow and Blaze die after she gave birth. Maybe Blaze ends up moving to Sonic's dimension or some years later because something terrible happens on her planet. We don't know. There's so many stories and theories that can be made about this. But the point is, it is possible that Shadow and Blaze are more likely to be Silver's biological parents as opposed to anyone else. Except that your timeline is absolute garbage. One year is 25 years, remember. To get to our 200 years, we'd only need 8 years. The problem then becomes that Silver needs to get to Sonic's world to be part of the devastated future. Now you could say that Silver was born in Sonic's world or was taken there shortly after his birth, except you need like a million things to go exactly perfectly for this to even be a thing. Silver would need to be born exactly at the end of this 8 year period, then Silver would need to get back to Sonic's world, Shadow and Blaze need to be killed for Silver to grow up an orphan, yeah I brought that point back from the very beginning, you're welcome, and Silver needs to have someone to raise him in this devastated future where the streets are literally made of lava. There's also the fact that Silver can't know who his parents are. He doesn't know either Blaze or Shadow are his parents. This means he has to be abandoned before he can gain the cognizance required to recognize his parents. I haven't found much data on this subject, but I'd reckon Silver would need to be abandoned at a very early age, within the first few years of his life. After all, I'm sure brightly colored anthropomorphic animals would be far easier to recognize than humans. Oh, but we're not done yet! I was all ready to move on to my final thoughts, but Guy still isn't done! He still has a few more points to go! Now here are some key points to back my theory up. Silver and Shadow both have chest fur. Wow, thanks for reminding me that fur exists! Now remind me how black and purple make white, because silver can't just be silver for no reason if you catch my drift. They both cannot run fast. They are both slow. Only reason Shadow is fast is because of his hover shoes. Excuse me? It's always been ambiguous whether Shadow's speed does or doesn't come solely from his air shoes. Some sources like Sonic Rivals 2 and Twitter Takeover 4 have said yes, while others such as the manual for Shadow the Hedgehog say no. There's no telling what the real answer is, so it's unwise to assume. Also, Silver and Blaze both have similar eye color. 
Although Silver's eyes are yellow and Blaze's eyes are amber, Amber still has a strong attachment with yellow. But looking at it in the game, you don't really see much of a difference. Until you straight up point it out. Also, did you know that Blaze was originally going to be in Shadow's place for Sonic Adventure 2? That's right. Blaze came in development first before Shadow, although she didn't really look the way she does now. She looked more like Shadow, except with blue streaks in her hair and she was all black. She still had the same name and everything, but Sega decided to add Shadow instead and then later worked on Blaze's appearance for Sonic Rush and made her look how she does now. So no wonder Blaze and Shadow are both very similar in concept and personality, which makes it more easier to be able to connect Blaze and Shadow together. This point is a load of bunk and a straight up lie. The concept of Blaze that you have shown was not from Sonic Adventure 2. It was from the much more predictable answer, Sonic Rush. The two concept images were found from a PowerPoint presentation made in 2005, far beyond the release of Sonic Adventure 2, that detailed planned features for, you guessed it, Sonic Rush. There's no big conspiracy here. Blaze was never meant to replace Shadow. End of story. Furthermore, did you know that in the Archie comics, Shadow and Blaze kind of had a weird connection development thing going on? Mamma mia put me out of my misery. Archie is not canon. I shouldn't have to argue this, but here I am. I won't argue too deep because this is really a nothing point in relation to everything else, but I've made my piece. Thankfully, Guy is done. Time for final thoughts on his theory. Do you remember the mantra I recited just a couple theories ago? Circumstance is fine, but too much circumstance leads to theories that can be blown down at a moment's notice. This is the definition of too much circumstance. This theory is Assumption City. This theory assumes that Shadow and Blaze somehow had enough canon interaction with each other to fall in love, Shadow moved to Blaze's dimension for a solid eight years, they had a kid with a drastically different fur color than either of them, then they went back to Sonic's world, abandoned Silver, and Silver somehow grew up with someone else in a lava-filled hexscape where life would be hard-pressed to even survive. There's way too many what-ifs in this theory that can all be explained away. But now it's time for Scourge. And I guess we're changing characters again, because the Avatar Machine wants to finally give me my Arc 5 characters back. Sadistic villainous alternate version of main character from another dimension against sadistic villainous alternate version of main character from another dimension? I'll take it. Roll the theory. Now, while I'm not here to establish exactly whom Silver's parents could be, as many people seem to do, I am determined to prove once and for all who started Silver's family bloodline 200 years before his future? Start taking notes, guy. Bumba! Well, obviously, in order for this theory to be worth debate, his ancestors would have to be characters we already know well, part of the main cast and such, and I have a likely candidate for the first of two companions that would kickstart Silver's family tree. Someone with prior knowledge of psychic skills. Someone who's interacted with Silver directly and may perhaps be the key to this entire theory. I'm talking about the hot-blooded, hammer-wielding, exuberantly obsessive but all-round lovable pink hedgehog, Amy Rose. But Scourge, Amy Rose has a rotomania! Now while it might strike some as odd that Amy would be of distant relation to Silver, there is a strong and prevailing possibility that she could be based on an intriguing piece of evidence to do with her character. After all, it might be known to some, but for those who don't know, every profile of Amy dating back to Sonic the Hedgehog CD makes sure to make reference to her interest in magical practices and her hobby of tarot card reading. Take a shot every time Scourge says tarot instead of tarot. You won't get alcohol poisoning, I swear. To me, this would imply that Amy is capable of some latent psychic abilities. Extrasensory perception, or ESP to be precise. Tarot reading is a form of cardomancy, an occult fortune telling technique practiced using cards to gain insight into a person's present, future, or past. Amy supposedly used her know how of the mystic arts to gain divinatory knowledge of her fate of meeting with the love of her life, Sonic the Hedgehog, on the legendary Little Planet, where the events of Sonic CD ultimately took place. And while some might say this tarot aficionado is no indication of psychic mastery, as her meeting with Sonic may have just been pure coincidence, Amy has been seen using her tarot cards since the events of Sonic CD, in the likes of Sonic Battle, and through her tarot draw power move in Sonic Chronicles, the description of which reads Amy foresees the future with her tarot deck, cursing a single foe and causing the target to miss subsequent attacks. Amy's also shown incredible proficiency in tracking skill, able to locate a person no matter where they are on the planet, especially Sonic, going so far as describing her skillfulness as being able to feel or sense Sonic's presence. In Psycho 6, she goes on the premise that it's just her girlish intuition that allows her to do this, but perhaps she's just blissfully ignorant to the true nature of her hidden potential. Amy may indeed be hiding some dormant ESP or clairvoyant abilities that perhaps she herself is not fully aware of. And of course, a correlative evolution of ESP 
is psychokinesis. The likelihood of Amy Rose being of some distant relation to Silver is highly likely based on this rudimentary evidence. It's just really, really distant. I'm not even saying you're wrong, just that it's a huge stretch. Amy's clairvoyance isn't even that powerful. Yes, she can sense Sonic anywhere in the world, but that's about it. She needs a tarot deck to be able to do anything else. This does not translate to the kinds of psychic powers that Silver is capable of. Furthermore, you know what psychic power Silver conveniently doesn't have? Clairvoyance! Explain to me why that's the one psychic power missing from Silver's skill set, hmm? Silver did also share a lot of screen time with Amy in his introductory title, Sonic 06, sharing a strong connection with the Hedgehog, aiding her on her mission despite it being of no interest to him and hesitating to harm her when she attempted to stop him despite his relentlessness towards other characters. Context is magic! Silver is actually helping Amy because she promised to help him in return. As for why he doesn't attack Amy when she defends Sonic, Silver isn't that kind of person. He isn't Shadow. The only people he's ever gone after are Sonic, who he believed was the cause of the world's destruction, and Shadow, who attacked Silver first. Besides those two, Silver is a gentle person with a kind heart. He doesn't attack people for no reason. Also, this point is going to really bite at a later point in this video. Keep in mind that Scourge's point here is assuming that Silver knows Amy is his ancestor and this is the reason he doesn't attack her. Got it? Alright, we're moving on. So, if perhaps Amy is the threshold for Silver's bloodline, that begs the question, who would her spouse be? Well, evidently, that brings us to one of the most prevalent fan theories for Silver's lineage. Yes, I am of course referring to Shadow the Hedgehog. Wait for it. It's common belief from theorists and shippers alike that Shadow may be of some blood connection to Silver based on their personality traits, physical similarities, and proficiency in harnessing chaos energy. On top of that, I'm sure I know most of you are aware of Sonic the Black Knight's little nod on this matter, in which one of the most glaring and endlessly quoted sources of evidence is Silver's portrayal in the game as Sir Galahad. For those unfamiliar with Arthurian legends, Galahad is the illegitimate son of Sir Lancelot and Elaine of Corbenic. Sir Lancelot, of course, being represented in the game as a doppelganger of Shadow. This led to one of the most baffling and widely debated notions ever embraced the Sonic fanbase that Shadow and Amy are either the parents or the final logical answer to Silver's distant ancestors. Be it that Silver is at least four generations ahead of them, he couldn't possibly be the child of anyone from the current. And as a little fun fact, we are all aware of Shadow's eye color, red, and Amy's, green. Well, it's usually coincidental that when you mix these two primary colors together, you end up with yellow. However, despite all this irrefutable evidence, I'm sorry to say, dear Shad Amy lovers, that this theory simply cannot be true. Which is why you spent an entire over a minute talking about why Shadow was the perfect contender to be Silver's ancestor, right? Come on, Scourge, learn to cut the fat, man. In February of this year, a YouTuber by the name of Hello Kitty Power contacted Takashi Izuka of Sonic Team, one of the original creators of Shadow the Hedgehog, and brought the matter to his attention, to which he confirmed that Shadow is not Silver's ancestor. So Silver is not a descendant of Shadow, nor is he related to him in any way. Remember when I was laughing at Guy earlier when he was talking about all the evidence for Shadow being Silver's father? I'm absolutely dying over this in the face of every single time Miyamoto, Koizumi, and every other Mario developer under the sun have made my life absolutely miserable. It's so cathartic to see the other side getting it for once. Thank you so much, Izuka. You've been wonderful. So if Shadow is not his relative, but we know Silver is 100% born and bred Hedgehog, then the next best and far more believable contender for the title is... Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, that's right, guys. I believe that Sonic is actually Silver's ancestor. Never did I once think it was Shadow. Just as I mentioned with Shadow, the similarities are all there. The personality, a strong sense of justice, the physical features, the shape of his eyes and quills, and of course, Sonic's natural gift for chaos control manipulation. However, there is already a glaring misconception that many will wrongly criticize this theory for. Silver's overflowing chest tuft and Sonic's lack thereof. Now, come on, guys. Just like Shadow, I'm sure Sonic is fully capable of growing that fur clump if he wanted to. If the females of the Sonic continuity are represented as having body fur, but then other characters such as Rouge don't, then the answer is obvious. These characters don't just lack fur in these areas for no reason, that would be ridiculous. And not enough to dispute this theory over. It's clear that some of the characters simply remove fur or hair from these areas for style purposes. How about no? There's absolutely no proof of this being the case. First of all, genetics are a thing. Some anthropomorphic animals might be genetically able to grow fur in certain places and others might not. Sonic might just be on the follically lacking end of the gene pool for all we know. For second, your example is one of the worst examples I've ever heard for anything, period. Every single Sonic female is a completely different species. Amy is a hedgehog, Rouge is a bat, and Blaze is a cat. While Blaze might be able to grow fur all over her body as a cat, a bat like Rouge might not be able to grow any fur on her body, only on her head. 
You have absolutely no evidence to say this assumption is false, and it's an enormous stretch to say otherwise. Heck, I would have taken Amy somehow magically having a fur tuft on her body underneath those dresses she wears. I would have argued like heck, but it would have made more sense than this. It's obvious the girls of the Sonic U might want to do this, but not entirely unbelievable that Sonic would too, being, as I've mentioned before, that Sonic is quite self-absorbed and thrives on image. Not unlike myself, I might add. He takes pride in looking good, and for these reasons, he might be tempted to take it down a notch on his arms and chest to maintain that classic look. Sonic doesn't care what people think of him. That's a canon fact. Sonic has never cared about his public image. Also, Sonic doesn't own a house. He sleeps in trees. You think he would own a razor? But a further driving point that might cause opposition to Sonic being a part of Silver's lineage is their vast, colossal, Grand Canyon-like difference in speed. Now, I do believe the gift of an enhanced speed was passed down to the few generations since Sonic, but here's how I think the cycle of transmutation took place. I believe Sonic's original super speed ability would be what I can only describe as diluted with each newborn in the family tree, and 200 years later, would have almost completely vanished from their genetic makeup. And while I said his speed may have been passed down to the first few, I instead believe that his speed triggered a different alteration in the bloodlines that would follow. Sonic's speed stimulated the hyper-development of ESP abilities passed down from Amy as the bloodline advanced. But with all that stimulus going elsewhere, it prompted a degenerative reaction in actual physical power and speed. As the genealogy grew, their ESP powers grew more stronger, but they slowly lost their physical speed. Until 200 years worth of evolution and propagation later and you get Silver the Hedgehog, unquestionably a master of psychic energy. What? I'm not even sure how to begin arguing this. I don't know how this point was developed. I'm honestly at a loss for words. I'll try anyway, though. <clears throat> That's not how that works. How come Amy's actual powers get passed down, but Sonic's powers don't? How come they go to every other area except physical ability? Why would they go so far outside their original purpose and enhance everything that's not themselves? Why would they dilute like this? None of this makes any gosh dang sense and my head is spinning! The room stopped moving, I wanna get off! Of course, as I mentioned before, some might discredit this theory based on fur or eye color as a defining factor in this hypothesis, being that Sonic and Amy, both green-eyed beings, are more than likely to have a green-eyed child with a brightly colored coat. But that's not necessarily true. Eye and hair color is the result of genetic inheritance. As basic as I can put it, iris and hair pigmentation, as we know it, is believed to be caused by thousands of years of mixed bloodlines. One gene in particular, OCA2, is responsible for the production of a protein called P-protein, a protein found in melanocytes. Unique cells in control of supplying melanin to our eyes, our skin, our hair, and more. And through a process called melogenesis, melanin is the groundwork pigment that governs the color of all these things. Variations in the OCA2 genes, called single nucleotide polymorphisms, more commonly known as SNPs, are what cause prominent mutations in eye and hair color. So in short, our colors can change randomly based on genetic mutations. And considering that we're speaking of four generations, of mixed bloodlines before silver, it's not far cry to say that silver's eye color might end up yellow through 200 years of family. Same with his ash-like fur color. Wow, at least when Matpat uses genetics, he uses the most likely outcomes. All right, Mr. Science Scourge, this time I'm not skipping the boring science lesson. Instead, I will be attempting to argue the boring science lesson. Amber is actually a real eye color. It's a really rare eye color though, somewhere between hazel and green. For context, eye color is produced by two different kinds of melanin, eumelanin and pheomelanin. I am probably butchering these, oh no. Brown eyes have the highest amount of melanin. Blue eyes have a low amount of melanin, which allows the eyes to scatter blue light. Green eyes, though, have a low amount of eumelanin, but a fair amount of pheomelanin. Then there's hazel and amber. No one really knows how hazel and amber eyes really work. In studies where scientists try to predict eye color based on single nucleotide polymorphisms in the OCA2 gene, they always have the least accuracy pinpointing hazel eyes for this exact reason. It's estimated that about 5% of human beings have hazel eyes and about the same amount have amber eyes. This brings us back to silver. Sure, a single nucleotide polymorphism in the OCA2 gene could cause silver's eyes to change from green to amber, but using human genetics as Scourge is using here, it's not likely. Not only would the polymorphism have to change the one nucleotide that would make Silver's eyes amber, but it would have to be either in Silver specifically or it would have to not get drowned out as the genes get passed on through the generations, which is entirely likely considering how genetics works. 
That's the other thing Scourge has been forgetting this entire time. When you're working with ancestors instead of direct parents, you have to take into account that there's more than one generation you're working with. That doesn't just mean direct offspring. That means whatever other outside genes are going to come into the family through mating. If Sonic and Amy had a son, that son would need to find a wife so they could have a child who would then have to find a mate so they could have a child who would then have to find their own mate so then they could proceed to have Silver. That's a lot of outside genetics that could either hurt or help Silver's case, as they could either give or cancel out certain traits like hair color, eye color, or that precious fur tuft you went on and on about. Oh yeah, going back to that, remember how I was talking about how genetics might work for anthropomorphic animals? Yeah, you want to predict how genetics and candy-colored super-powered anatomically inaccurate animals works? Good luck, because if we played by the laws of human genetics, Silver is an albino that doesn't at all have the red or violet eyes that are typically characteristic of albinos, instead having one of the rarest non-albino eye colors in the entire human race. He's a freak of nature. Good luck explaining that one away with SNPs. <sighs> and that's Scourge's theory. This theory wanted so badly to sweep all of its inherent wonkiness under a rug of fancy not science and whatnot while ignoring the fact that none of it made any sense whatsoever. Scourge basically danced around issues instead of confronting them like a man. Sonic doesn't have a chest tuft? Oh, well everyone can grow hair, it's just some people shave. Silver isn't speedy? Oh, well Sonic's speed diluted over the years and instead it boosted Amy's supposed psychic abilities because I don't know. Sonic plus Amy doesn't equal white hedgehog with amber eyes? Single nucleotide polymorphism. Go back to the drawing board, Scourge. This theory needed more solid facts rather than shaky fake science. So we're done, right? Psych, show's not over yet, folks. We still have the grand finale. Guys, salt mine. Oh, hey, Silver's back, nice. Now you're going to notice that I'm not once going to be touching Scourge's rebuttal to Guy's theory. This is for multiple reasons. For one, Scourge's rebuttal doesn't once show up in Guy's video. There are actually two versions of this video, Guy's version being the one I'm covering here. The only differences between the two are the opening statements and which rebuttal you get. I'm going to go over why this is an enormous freaking problem in my final thoughts, but that's not the only reason I'm doing things the way I am. The other reason is that there really isn't much wrong with Scourge's rebuttal. Sure, I could nitpick one or two points, but his statements are overall sound despite being largely nebulous, supposedly to avoid sparking controversy or whatnot, even though Scourge would ultimately be in the right. Guy's rebuttal, though, is the far more interesting of the two. You'll see why in three, two, one. Well, you've made some pretty good arguments in your debate theory as well, Scourge. And like so, I can't say I agree with any of them. Ooh, did you see that sick burn? Someone get Scourge some aloe vera. Looks like when Scourge wanted to play fair. Now, while this is a theory debate, we aren't here to belittle each other's theories. No, we are here to remain open-minded and honest. Someone didn't get the memo. I can't say I agree with any of them. That one's gonna hurt in the morning. Both theories are very plausible, but in my mind, the most far-fetched theory is the idea that Sonic is Silver's ancestor. Not trying to state Sonic 06 is canon. Hold up, you think Sonic 06 isn't canon? That's a riot coming from the guy that prefaced Silver's entire backstory with the events of Sonic 06. You really know how to stay consistent, don't you, guy? But wasn't Silver trying to kill Sonic throughout most of that game? If Silver succeeded, he would have inadvertently wiped out his entire lineage. There's where that point against Scourge comes back. Yeah, I was never done. I was just waiting. Scourge's point about Silver helping and not harming Amy revolved around him knowing that Amy was his ancestor, yet pegging Sonic as the other parent completely killed that entire argument. For one, Silver should have known who Sonic was the entire time if Scourge's point held up, and two, Silver shouldn't have been afraid to hurt Amy if his end goal was going to wipe out his entire lineage anyway. Yeah, guy pretending like Silver would have inadvertently done that? He obviously wasn't listening to the actual point of Scourge bringing up 06. And I know you may say that that's what Mephilus wanted to achieve since he was toying with everyone in the game, except that Mephilus did kill Sonic towards the end. That alone should have made Silver vanish like Marty McFly almost did in Back to the Future. Except that Mephilus then proceeded to destroy Time as Solaris. Notice that Silver was brought back to the past even though he had already gone back to the future. That should solidify that Solaris broke time. That's the only reason Silver continued to exist. Please, pay attention. Furthermore, you know what's super ironic and hilarious about this statement? The notion was actually directly addressed by Scourge in his own video. 
Despite these historical rewrites, many of which Silver is the cause of, Silver himself has become decoupled from the time stream, existing outside the correct flow of time. Meaning that when the Hedgehog ultimately saves his future with the help of Sonic and his friends, he doesn't immediately snap back to his future with lost or reshapen memories, apart from the likes of the Solaris reset in Sonic 06, which more than likely affected all possible timelines and time itself. In the wake of the several paradoxical events that take place in the games, his existence is never at risk, nor does he ever go all see-through like in Back to the Future. This is part of the opening statements to Scourge's theory that Guy completely cut out of his own video. Essentially, Scourge is working under the assumption that Silver is completely detached from the time stream, so things that would change the flow of time thusly do not affect him. Just the fact that the Marty McFly analogy in itself was directly addressed is enough to crack me up. Talk about not paying attention, am I right? Also, Izuka may have made a statement about Shadow not being Silver's father, but if there's another thing Sonic and Dragon Ball Z have in similarities is that there's no consistency in their continuity. Just like Toriyama, Izuka has contradicted himself many times before about Sonic lore. Huh? What? Oh, sorry, guess I'm just deaf to the first world problems of the overprivileged coming from the continuity slum we call the Mario fandom. In all seriousness, quit being a brat. If there's one thing I've learned over the years, it's that continuity in video game franchises is never perfect. The best rule of thumb is to take the most current and relevant information that hasn't yet been contradicted and roll with that. If it gets thrown out later, then too bad. Right now, though, that's your canon. Take it or leave it. Oh hey, guess what piece of information is the most current, relevant, uncontradicted piece of information on the table regarding the relationship of Shadow and Silver? Also, hi, Post Miku here. You're gonna be hearing a lot from me because honestly, this part of the video makes me a lot angrier than I'd care to admit and I realized I missed a fair number of points I could have said. Let's start with the fact that this point on Guy's part is filled with so much snobbish entitlement trying to ride off confirmation bias that it honestly makes me sick. Basically, Guy is going to tie this bias into some kind of prejudice towards Shadow the Hedgehog, which we'll hear in a moment, but that's basically taking one mistake Izuka made in 2005 and applying it to his state 11 years down the road. Of course, we're going to talk about said supposed mistake. The point right now, though, is that this is a super scummy move on Guy's part to try to discredit someone that said one thing Guy didn't like. This is not a good practice, and it is not a good look on you, Guy. You want to talk about inconsistencies? Talk about yourself for a while, then come back to me. And Shadow the Hedgehog, the video game, is definitely one of them. Filled with tons of plot holes, inconsistencies, and the forced plot line of the Black Arms that don't even follow the original plot of Shadow in Sonic Adventure 2. No wonder Sonic 06 was supposed to be a soft reboot for the franchise. Ooh, ouch. Shadow the Hedgehog takes place directly after the events of Sonic Heroes, where Shadow is still trying to recover his memories after losing them due to his fall from the Space Colony arc, the end of Sonic Adventure 2. At this time, the Black Comet, a comet that passes by the planet once every 50 years, reappears once again, carrying a race of aliens called the Black Arms with it. The leader of the Black Arms, Black Doom, appears to Shadow and commands him to retrieve the Chaos Emeralds. Shadow, believing the aliens to be the key to unlocking his past, raises off to Westopolis to begin his journey into remembering his past. Much of the confusion of this game comes from the game's multiple storylines. Depending on Shadow's actions over the course of the game, different events and endings can occur. Psych! You thought those were endings? No! All ten standard endings of the game Shadow the Hedgehog are actually, quote from the Sonic Wiki, distortions of the truth. After obtaining all ten endings, the last story opens up, which is the true and only canon ending to the game, where Black Doom reveals that Professor Gerald used Black Doom's DNA to create Shadow, demands and subsequently takes the Chaos Emeralds, warps the Black Comet down to the planet, and fights Shadow for the final time. Shadow defeats Black Doom, then warps the Black Comet back into orbit and destroys it with the Eclipse Cannon before giving one final farewell to Gerald and Maria. This is to denote that he is moving on from his past and looking toward the future. From here on, his mentions of Maria are fewer and in many instances non-existent, and his outlook has changed greatly. Now, you might be talking about how it's impossible to make out what besides the last story actually happened. Fair enough. Even so, it goes back to a point I made in a previous theory of yours I covered. Even if a game in this franchise isn't canon, the characters are so well defined that there are still consistent things that persist from various character interpretations that give us clearer ideas of who these characters are. Even if the events of this game didn't happen, they still give us a window into how these characters would act if these situations ever did happen. It's wrong to completely disregard it if Sega hasn't, which, for the record, they haven't. 
Shut your mouth and sit down. Also, post Miku again. Your claim that Shadow the Hedgehog supposedly contradicts Sonic Adventure 2 is completely 100% false. In fact, this game builds on what Sonic Adventure established and gives us a much clearer timeline of the ultimate lifeform experiments in Project Shadow, giving reasons for why things turned out the way they did and why Gunn finally decided to raid the Ark, arrest Gerald, and kill Maria. There's absolutely no contradiction to be found here, unless you want to actually give evidence for your ridiculous claim. For example, Sonic Heroes, because past me is going to bring it up in the next point, its plot holes come from the fact that the teams all seem to be going through the same events at the same time, which would be literally impossible without their stories overlapping more than just the few times they run into each other for team battles. There. Your turn, Fricker. On top of all that, this has nothing to do with Izuka's statement about Shadow not being related to Silver or either of your theories. Neither of you once brought up Shadow the Hedgehog, so mentioning it out of the blue is tacky and it makes it all the more obvious that you're just grasping at straws to discredit Izuka on any grounds you can. Your scumbag is showing, put it away before someone notices. Also in the Shadow Theory, when I said he suffered from false memory syndrome, my friend Husky Z and I didn't even use the game Shadow the Hedgehog as part of the theory, because that game is as non-canon as Sonic 06 is. As non-canon as Sonic 06 is, you sir would make for an excellent comedian. Sonic 06, like it or not, is still canon as ever, even with being completely erased from the timeline. In Sonic Colors, Silver and Blaze note the strangely familiar feeling of having teamed up together before, this being a clear callback to Sonic 06. Also, do you remember when you yourself said that Shadow and Sonic both still remembered the events of this game? That was a big whoopsie on your part, wasn't it? As for Shadow the Hedgehog, it's still canon too. If Shadow the Hedgehog hadn't happened, Shadow wouldn't have regained his memories and gotten over his past, and he wouldn't be a gun agent, two of the main things that define his character in the modern day. Whether you like it or not, this game is just as canon as the rest. Just because the game is bad doesn't mean it's not canon. Just because the game has plot holes doesn't mean it's not canon. You want to talk about plot holes? Let's talk about Sonic Heroes for a while, shall we? That's not even mentioning that precious game you seem to lean back on for your dimensional nonsense and whatnot, Sonic Chronicles. I hope you realize Sonic Chronicles is really shaky canonically. The game was supposed to receive a sequel to mend its cliffhanger ending that never came to be, leaving the state of the game in canon very uncertain. Most have completely dismissed this game's canonicity altogether, especially since Sega is often assumed to have disowned this game after the whole lawsuit with Ken Penders. Yet here you are. You're clearly not throwing Sonic Chronicles under the It's Not Canon bus now, are you? Oh, but this all gets so much worse. Also, I do remember avoiding the Archie Sonic comics back when I started doing these theories, but these comics are based on the Sonic universe and are approved by Sega, so they should be treated as such. Some fans tend to alienate them when in fact the comics tell a better story and have better developed characters than the video games themselves. So if Sonic and Princess Sally can marry and have children in the comics, then the same can be applied in the games. For one, shut up and get out of my house! The Archie comics are not canon by any stretch of the imagination, and calling them a better story is not a valid point to say they are. Also, I love how irony strikes you heavy-handed over the head. Hey guy, guess what two games are canon in the Archie universe? If you said Sonic 06 and Shadow the Hedgehog, congratulations! The comics even took the liberty of expanding upon Shadow the Hedgehog in particular, creating a sort of Black Arms brother for Shadow called Eclipse or something like that. Sue me, I can't be bothered to actually know things about the Archie comics. And post Miku for the final time, isn't it just wonderful how Guy's own language here slaps him across the face? The Archie comics should be canon because they're technically quote approved by Sega, huh? And Shadow the Hedgehog and Sonic 06 aren't? How about your blatant double standards considering Archie 2 is full of plot holes and constantly goes back on itself to retcon things? As the cherry on top, this still has absolute bupkis to do with either of your theories. There's a million ways this point falls apart and you're standing in the middle of it crying about your precious theory being disproved by the writer and director of a game you didn't like. Come off yourself and act like a professional because right now you're acting like a child. And at the end of this, I should probably stress that these sentiments go out to the guy present in this video, the one from 2016. Guy, if you see this, which you may or may not because I don't hecking know if you will, please keep that in mind. Case in point, Go home, guy. Your perception of canon is drunk. Also like DBZ, a Saiyan can marry a human being and still pass his Super Saiyan powers and features to his offspring. 
So with Shadow being like Vegeta and Silver being like Trunks, this is possible. The comparisons speak for themselves. Oh yeah, let's pretend like that point is at all relevant. Well, that's the end of this festival of follies. I already gave my final thoughts on both theories individually, but I think it's only right to do a full, all-encompassing final thoughts. Again. Yeah, this is a rewrite of my final thoughts, I'm gonna admit. Why is it a rewrite of my final thoughts? Well, the first time I wrote my final thoughts, I had no idea Scourge's video existed. Sue me for not being observant enough to realize it, but going off the assumption that this video was the only one that existed for the longest time gave me a revelation that I might not have come to otherwise. Essentially, my role the first time around was exactly the same role a first time watcher of Guy's video would come to. Not once is it ever stated within Guy's video that there's another video to be found. And why would someone assume that there's essentially a duplicate video with a bit of bonus content floating around? Yes, he mentions this in the middle of his description, which is really only visible under the show more barrier, but that assumes that most people will read YouTube descriptions beyond the first few sentences, which, I'm sorry, doesn't often happen. You need to account for an audience member that has no idea what's going on. This is basic YouTubing 101. Back to the video, though. This was rough. Guy and Scourge had absolutely no chemistry, the video felt disjointed, both theories were awful in their own special ways. Honestly, this should have been two completely separate videos, although Guy's salt factory at the end there was more entertaining than it should have been. I know that it technically is two separate videos, but the meat of the content is exactly the same, so that doesn't even count. These two didn't do anything to make me feel like they should have been presenting side by side. Both their theories were separate from one another and both their debate portions were cordoned off in their own separate corners. There was no interaction here. It felt like these two wanted nothing to do with each other despite how much they wanted to act like friends. If you're going to do a collaboration, actually do a collaboration. If you're going to do a debate, actually do a proper debate. A proper debate needs a back and forth argument or it just feels like the person on the end of the video bashing the other's theory in with a mace for no real reason. I mean, it's not like Guy had any solid ground to stand on anyway, but I would have at least liked to see him realize it. <sighs> now, it's about time I get down to the root of the problem. If it's the bob theory that started this mess, it's the bob theory that's gonna fix it, right? Hopefully.